Hi, everyone. Welcome to the merry month of June, and it's uh, beautiful out there, and uh, there's also a lot going on in the world, and I'm so grateful that those of you who are here today felt it important enough to attend this meeting. And we're hearing more and more about gratitude being the key to success in times of great stress. And uh, in fact, I attended a webinar uh, just earlier this week by, uh, led by IIL France, and it was a meetup group that really was superb. I had to really remember all my French skills from uh, high school and college, but they did a magnificent job, Jennifer Sabine and uh, Michelle Longpre, and uh, they actually had me do an introduction in French. So. But it was gratitude, the key to success in times of stress. It, it was a better title than that, but that was the basic one. And uh, today I'm really delighted to have a, a world-class expert in design thinking and innovation. Uh, and, that, and that is John Coyle. And Rakhdu, if you want to uh, just give us our webcams. We, we're going to say hello uh, in person for a moment. And uh, we're not going to keep the webcams on due to bandwidth issues. But John, if you would just uh, say hello. This is Judy here, and you all know me. And, hey, Judy. Uh, John, we both hello, everybody. You are. Wow. Keeping track of time you are, aren't you? Always. <laughs> Many, many clocks. Well, we're so happy to have you here today. And I'll never forget when uh, IAL CEO Laverne Johnson came back from the Dubai <clears throat> Conference on uh, Project Management and Innovation. She said, we've got to have John Coyle for our Leadership and Innovation Conference. And so it became my job to get John Coyle in a good way. And uh, we were delighted to have you as our, uh, as a keynote speaker, you did a fantastic presentation. I advise everybody to see it. And, you know, you're a, an Olympic uh, uh, medalist, a silver medalist, and that's really exciting, too. The design thinking and the speed skating and the cycling, we, we've got a great package here. And most important to us here today is that gratitude and grateful leadership helped you really, really get a handle on your career and what you wanted to do with your life. So, John, we're delighted to have you. And uh, Roxy, let's uh, go back to the narrow bandwidth sharing of the slides. So as those load, I'll just begin by saying uh, what Judy said is true. I actually wouldn't be here speaking to you right now if it weren't for a couple of really key acts of gratitude in my life that fundamentally changed the entire trajectory of my life. I, as you may or may not know, I was an Olympic speed skater. And that sort of became a reality over time as uh, when I was a kid, I had a coach named Mike Walden. And uh, you know, I grew up in a lake in Michigan, began skating at age three, and by age 10, Mike Walden had become my coach. And, and Mike really had, you know, one thing he always said, which was, uh, race your strengths. Race your strengths. He'd say that a thousand times. And rather than try to fix your weaknesses, uh, design around them. So fast forward, I'm uh, in college. I'm 21 years old at Stanford in California with no coach, no training program, very little ice time, and I still managed to get 12th place in the world championships in the sport of speed skating. So when I graduate, I have two more years to prepare for the Olympics. And now that I'm going to have you know, full-time support from the Olympic program, I think everything's going to go great. I'm going to go from 12th to 6th to 1st. But the Olympic team, despite their best intentions, put me on a program of fixing my weaknesses. And I managed to go from 12th to 34th to not even making the team, two years later finishing 30th in the US trials that I had won two years prior. And it was about this point that I thought I would quit. 
It was terrible. Uh, but I just kept thinking about what Mike used to say, and, and, I, and I kept coming back to, wait, why am I focused on fixing my weaknesses instead of erasing my strengths? And so I decided to quit the team, not the not the sport, and go back on my Mike Walden training program, and I started changing my technique. And you know, one thing I learned at this point in my career, sometimes when you're facing a problem and banging your head against a wall like this, uh, sometimes when you back up and get perspective, this is what your problem looks like. So I started training all on my own in Milwaukee, and a year later, one year to the day later, I hadn't raced at all. I showed up to the US World Championships team trials, which is the same thing as the Olympic trials in a non-Olympic year, so the most important meet of the year. And in the exact same competition that I finished 30th the year prior, in my first race back in a sport where hundreds of seconds determined first from seconds, second place, I broke the US record by five and a half seconds and broke the world record by over a full second. All this because I doubled down on my strengths instead of trying to fix my weaknesses. So Mike was an amazing coach, and he was my coach uh, all the way up until uh, 96 when he passed away. And you know, if you doubt you know, how amazing Mike is, this is what he produced. During his career as a volunteer unpaid coach, he produced 12 world champions, 10 Olympians, 6 Olympic medals, and 28% of all post-World War II national cycling medalists of both genders of all ages. And here's the thing. I trained with Mike for 16 years. He passed away in 96. Uh, in 97, I showed up in his driveway to, uh, to do our training rides, because even though he was gone, we still met there, because that's where training rides left from. And his widow, Harriet, met me in the driveway one morning, and she pulled me inside the house. I'd never been inside. And she said, I just want you to know that Mike was really fond of you. Now, Mike only yelled at me. So I didn't uh, know how to take that. I was like, well, I kind of thought he hated me. She's like, no, he could see your strengths even more clearly than you could. He knew you'd be an Olympic champion someday, and now you are. And then she pointed to a picture of Mike and I that I had no idea was inside that house. And here's the heartbreaking part. Mike was my coach for 16 years. Not once did I ever say thank you. Not one time. I did get a chance to posthumously thank him. A couple years later, I spoke at our annual club meeting, and I was able to obtain a second Olympic podium jacket in Harriet's size, which was extra small and gave this talk and then was able to give her the jacket. She was 98 years old. Um, and she actually passed just last year at age 106. So she, she went on for a, a good full life. So Mike changed my life. Um, a few years later, something happened that was uh, very significant as well. And I'll, I'll uh, share this with you. I, I, after the 94 Olympics, where I won a silver medal, I trained all the way through 98, and my goal was to win a gold medal, of course. Um, I did this silly thing in 97, is I got lured back into uh, joining the Olympic team. And so I joined them in Lake Placid, and they put me on that same old program, and, and it didn't work for me. And even though I won the first World Cup of the year, Apollo Ono, if you remember him, was second, uh, by the time the actual Olympic trials came around, I was so overtrained and overtired that I ended up 13th place and didn't make the team. And I was so embarrassed, and I say that word specifically, I was so humiliated that I got off the ice after the last race at the Olympic trials. I didn't put on my skate guards because I knew I would never skate again. I walked across the concrete on my now dull blades, grabbed my skate bag, walked out to my car, took off my skates in the car, and then proceeded to drive 45 hours to Arizona, where I moved away from this life completely. Hard divorce, had nothing to do with it, never spoke about it, and became a consultant and went on with my life. However, 11 years later, I got a call from NBC. And they said, would you be our analyst for the next Olympics in Torino, Italy? And I couldn't say no to that, of course. So. There I am, back at the Olympics, and warmly welcome back. The parents and skaters knew me. I knew most of them, even though it had been 12 years. And I covered, I was the analyst, so I provided you know, uh, feedback on interviewing the coaches, parents, and skaters to 
the color commentary and commentarium. And on the 16th of 17 days at the Winter Olympics in Torino, uh, a parent pulled me aside the night before the gold medal round for the men's relay, my, my event, and in about 20 seconds, through an expression of gratitude, changed the entire trajectory of my life, and it is the only reason I'm speaking to you right now. So we're at dinner, and he pulled me aside. I, I, I knew him, but not very well. And I knew his son, and he said, hey, I want to tell you something. It's really important. And I said, okay. He looked nervous. He was very emotional. So we walked into the corner of the room, and he said, I just want you to know. And he started talking, and apparently my eyes wandered. So he grabbed the back of my head, and he pulled my eyes up so that I'd be meeting his eyes, and he said, I need you to listen. And I said, okay. He was a school teacher. So this is what he told me. He said, I just want you to know that we wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for you. And I said, I don't know what you mean. He said, you won't remember, but 12 years ago, after you won your silver medal, you came to a little reception in Bay City, Michigan. I brought my son, Alex. He was 11 years old at the time. You put your medal around his neck. You signed an autograph. The next day, he joined the Bay City Speed Skating Club. He'd never skated before in his life. And tomorrow, he's skating in the gold medal final. And that blew my mind. It was like the top of my cranium popped off. Everything that I felt for more than a decade, all that humiliation and anxiety and, and feeling like a failure, all washed away. All in 30 seconds. And it changed absolutely everything. I started coaching. I got my daughter in skating. She skated for six years. I coached three, three different clubs in the Chicago area. I began announcing uh, nationally and around the world. I attended uh, four more Olympics as the analyst, and most importantly, I started speaking about it. I had never spoken about it before, and for those that don't know me, this, by the way, is all I do now. I speak for a living, and I have told this story in over 25 countries, 17 of them in last year alone, and I get to share this amazing story of the expression of gratitude that leads to change. And that's the thing, and I was looking through your book. Judy, and you know, the fourth C, communication. You can feel gratitude all the time. I do this all the time, and I realize a lot of times I don't express it. Al, the boy's father, later, uh, we become good friends, um, he shared with me that he was one beer away from not telling me anything. So thank God for that beer. So, it, so anyway, I realized in that moment that everything was going to change. And so that evening, still in Italy, I wrote him a long email thanking him and, and letting him know that everything was going to change for me. And he waited until he got back from Torino three days later to write me back. And so I'll close off my portion here by reading to you what he wrote back to me, because this is what gratitude can give you. John, I am deeply touched and moved by your words and reaction. After I read your email, I went up to Alex's bedroom and looked at his bulletin board that holds only the most meaningful awards and memories of his childhood and skating career. Pinned near the right border in a Ziploc bag is a napkin from Steamer's Pub with your signature on it dated 1994, along with a picture of you with Alex and your silver medal. I then went to our Torino Olympic photos, and I found the picture of you with Alex and his bronze medal, which he won the very next night. I printed it off, returned to the bulletin board, carefully opened the bag, gently slid the new photo in, resealed the bag, and pinned it back in the exact same hole. I stepped back and contemplated the many things that had to have taken place in so many people's lives in order for those two photos to be in that bag together, hanging on a bulletin board in a boy's bedroom where he only dreamed of such success. As I stood and stared, I was overwhelmed by emotion as I again attempted to comprehend the awesome unifying power of the Olympic Games and values. Thank you for sharing your success with us 12 years ago, and thank you for including Alex and me in this circle of success 12 years later. And then this is the way he closes his letter to me. And I think it's so powerful. And it's his gift to all of us, I guess. I guess you never know what, what role you might play in someone's life or just how important the things you choose to do or say or choose not to do or say may turn out to be. If you have gratitude and you don't express it, then it doesn't see the power. I uh, really cool data model story. Three years ago, March, I got a call from Alex, the kid in the picture here, no longer a kid. We're good friends. Uh, I actually went skiing with him twice this winter. 
a uh, very call from him three years ago, and he was very excited. And he said, hey, I want you to be the first to know. I just got off the phone with the U.S. Olympic Committee. I have accepted the head coach position for U.S. speed skating, and I'll be taking the team to the Olympics in Pyeongchang. All this came from a very brief moment 12, 12 years prior that I barely remembered. But when you express gratitude at the right time in the right way, it literally changes people's lives. With that, I'll I turn it back to you. I think to take it, but I, I think um, i got to overcome my tears to talk. That is so beautifully expressed, John. I've heard the story before, and, and you know, I've listened to your uh, program several times on the uh, Leadership and Innovation Conference. And so I've heard it, and each time it's brand new, and it's just a total validation of what we're all doing here today and out in the world. And uh, I just can't thank you enough for sharing the wonderful story and your great commitment to expressing gratitude when you feel it to people. Because you know, being grateful is a very wonderful state. You can carry it around with you and not share it with anyone and appreciate nature, nature and, and your livelihood, assuming you still have one. And, uh, you know, all of those great things, but sharing your gratitude with another is the ultimate gift and your acknowledgement and your appreciation. So thank you for that incredibly dramatic story. No one here and, and no one who listens to it afterward will ever forget that story. So thank you. And we have time for a few questions now. If, if anyone else can find their voice and speak, it's, or, or you can text too. Cecilia said that was beautiful and inspiring. Absolutely, it's just there's no question about the power of expressing one's gratitude and appreciation. I think we're all speechless, John. <laughs> I think that what you said about um, you know, the end of his message is so powerful and important because people really don't ever know the value of what, of their words and what role they play with other people. And it, it takes a long time to really recognize that. But I think that most people have um, some kind of a you know, they, they don't quite know how good they are at things. And um, very frequently in my life, I've heard someone, you know, tell me that I made an impact on them in some way or another, and every time I'm shocked, I'm just absolutely shocked that I made some kind of an impact on someone. And I think that it's really important to acknowledge people for the impact that they make in our lives because people just simply don't seem to know. And I think that that's a form of acknowledgement that we are severely lacking. We don't reach out and tell people, hey, you mean this to me, or this action you took was very impactful for me for this reason. And I think that that's a big, uh, a big positive goal to work Well said, Roxy. And uh, Stephanie Hanko just texted, great story and so true about not knowing the impact we have on others. And I've experienced that many times when I, I get an email or a call, or, um, somebody telling me what a difference the, a webinar I led 10 years ago made. Uh, you know, it, it's just unimaginable, and the reminder is so important. Okay, Harry Waldron had a comment. Some, whoops, second. Um, Sometimes you never know where one small favor or extra effort will make the difference. Remember how a senior vice president thanked me and wrote my manager's note of uh, appreciation for simply running a, a quick report after hours. Got more appreciation from that than some major projects I was managing. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That's a great story, Harry. I, I sometimes when I speak, I'll, I'll ask the audience. It's, it's a setup, so you'll see it coming, especially the people in this line. But I'll say, who here needs a pat on the back to do their best work? 
and literally nobody will raise their hand, right? And then I'll say, okay, who here has been working on a project for maybe weeks, maybe longer, and somebody affiliated with the project or a leader comes by and says, wow, that's really amazing analysis you've been doing. I, I'm so excited to see the next report from you. And suddenly you double down in your efforts and you're producing even better than before. Anybody ever experienced this? And everybody raises their hand. I'm like, okay, so we here need to pat on the back to do their best work. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it's a little uh, hard to admit that we're so human, right. you know, and, uh, but it's true. It's just a basic human instinct, and uh, I remember the quote from Stephen Covey that next to physical survival, the emotional support through appreciation and acknowledgement are second in line to uh, you know, make people feel valued and safe as human beings. So, hey, Judy. Okay, questions or comments? I think people are, you know. Can you hear me, Judy? Overwhelmed. Oh, wait, I can I, hear you. Go ahead, yes. Yeah, this is, this is Jim Trella. Um, one of the things, and Judy, you will definitely recognize this, is part of, you know, as you give recognition and appreciation, that's important. But there's another side of the coin, and that's being able to accept that appreciation. You know, there are some, sometimes, and I am guilty of this, where somebody would acknowledge me for something I had done, and I blow it off, or I just kind of let it, you know, say, you oh, it was nothing. But somebody who happens to be on the line right now never let me got away, get away with that, did you, Judy? <laughs> No. <laughs> and when you think about that life-changing moment where you went from being, you know, when you went to changing your whole life to, to following the sport and speaking and all the other pieces that go along with it, it's that key point where you accept what people t talk about you and you realize, you may realize something new about yourself that you look and say, I can do this and I can move forward. And it is because of the fact that somebody took the moment out to tell you what you meant to them, to tell you how all of this how all of this came together. Because you did that, it may have been hanging a medal around somebody's neck. It may have been just stopping up and saying, "Thank you." You don't realize, you know, how important it was to me for you to get this report done, or the, or any of the other things that could happen in a project. But it's just amazing that you stop. And as Judy does, sometimes people say, oh, it was nothing. And sometimes, and Judy, you've even said this, sometimes you even, as they're waving their hand, no, you grab their hand and say, no, it was something. It's when that, uh, it was when the one, uh, the one teacher grabbed your hair and said, no, listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you have to do that, maybe not physically, but sometimes you have to do that so that people listen and realize it is coming from the heart and it's important. And accept that because it is. Yeah, I completely agree. A little funny uh, continuation of the story. Last year, Al, the father, called me. It was in March of last year. And he said, hey, Alex and I are doing a father-son getaway to um, Jamaica. And you've always told me you're willing to show up whenever, wherever. So what do you think? I'm like, heck yeah, I'll go. So we, he didn't tell Alex. So they were just walking along the beach. I'm sitting in a, a, a you know, a, a chase lounge, and they sit right next to us. And then I get a text from Alex, and he's like, "Dude, you would never believe it. You have like a doppelganger in Jamaica." <laughs> so then I take off my sunglasses, and he's just, his face went white. It literally went white. He's like, "What the?" That was a, that was a good couple of days. Wow, that's unbelievable. Well done, well done. And Harry just said, there's even a lack of appreciation that could be a danger to projects or relationships. Setting, timing, et cetera, are important factors as was shared in the excellent lesson we got today from our speaker. So thank you for that excellent lesson, John. And we will remember, as I said, we'll remember the story 
forever and will share it with people because uh, it's too important not to remember and too important to, to let it go. We, we have to use all the uh, support we can get because it's not always easy to express your gratitude and appreciation to people. It makes one feel vulnerable. Right. But any last words in closing, John? Uh, just I want to say thank you. I'm grateful uh, for being able to join you guys. And uh, hopefully this is a story that you found meaning in. And hopefully we can join you again sometime. Oh, it'd be wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, we hope you can stay for uh, some or the rest of the webinar. We'd love to show you what uh, the contributors who are, most of them are here today, uh, do on a monthly or weekly basis. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very exciting. Yeah, for sure. And, um, OK, great. Thank All right, you thank again. you. Want to give um, a, an email address? Oh, sure, I'll type some, it in. Uh, way to Somebody have, may have a need for a great speaker. You never know. Okay, johncoil.com is his website, and at johncoil.com. Perfect. Okay, so thank you, and. Uh, so we'll do our little show and tell here. And I'm going to start with the acrostic, uh, which Harry Waldron contributes every month, get the right attitude through gratitude, climb aboard the CGL Express. And this is the June one, Unite with Gratitude. And I was saying to Roxy as I read this, uh, Harry, you just live and breathe grateful leadership. I mean, he says the uh, acrostic is unite with gratitude. And it's, it, you have to read this. And this is all on the uh, Center for Grateful Leadership uh, website under articles, member articles. And you know, you, you live it, you breathe it, you walk it, you talk it. And I'm so grateful to you for um, just the way you've absorbed this whole initiative. And I always wonder, how can you do another month? And each one is different. And this is about understanding, nine or 10 people fail to say thank you, inspire the virtual team, teamwork. And it, it's all about you know the sum and substance of grateful leadership. So thank you, Harry. And then. Uh, we have we have the gratitude connection, and uh, Don Officer does an amazing job of connecting grateful leadership to major new uh, thought leaders' books, uh, traditional thought leaders, and I'm always just uh, awed and inspired that there is the connection that he does make. So uh, this is Gratitude Unending, and it's based on uh, um, the latest book by Simon Sinek, The Infinite. And Simon Sinek has an outstanding TED Talk um, that I'm sure we can find for you. But um, Roxy, do you, while, while we're just talking here, if you could just find, it's his uh, most watched TED Talk. And I, I urge everybody to uh, to watch it, it's, you know, like 17 minutes or so. Don, anything quick you'd like to say about this month's article? Can you hear us? Because at the moment, I can't hear you. Sorry, I, I stepped away for just one second. What was the uh, question? Did you miss all the praise and the appreciation? I, I, I probably gave. did. I went to get a glass of water. I'm so sorry. Bad timing. <laughs> it's OK. It's OK. Thank you, can, you know, for thanking you for making all the connections okay. that you do. And uh, it amazes me that you can, with every new and exciting 
self-development book, you uh, are able to connect it with grateful leadership in a real way. So okay. I, my I microphone's connected now. <laughs> um, anything you want to say about this? Oh, oh, okay. Go ahead. I can't hear you very well. Uh, can you uh, raise yes, the volume that up a little bit? Okay. A little bit more, I think. Roxy, can there, you? How's that? Five done. Is that better? Same. No, but I, I can hear you. Uh, I hope everyone else can. So, uh, why don't you just uh, say a few words about this okay. uh, Simon Sinek book? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. I'll shout. Show this on the shout. Okay. Just two or three <laughs> things. The first book he wrote probably uh, that really drew a lot of attention was um, um, about just ask why I believe it was. Um, and basically he was looking at uh, why you should get started on things, you know, and as he put it, looking into the past or looking at the beginning, looking at what brings you to this point. But he said this book, this one on the infinite game is about the future, where you want to go. And he said, if you choose to play a finite game, it's kind of like this particular round, this particular, uh, I suppose, job appointment, career move that you've made is it. They've just got to succeed at that. And of course, we all want to put our best in. But if you are limited by that belief, you don't see the possibility beyond that. And I think our speaker today really illustrated that very well. Uh, but the point about the infinite game is it's not just about you. It's about everyone. It's about everyone that you meet and everyone you can influence. And this is, I saw as the link to grateful leadership. You're not doing it just because you're going to, you know, get more performance out of the other person. So you can win some, uh, some particular, uh, goal you have in your organization. No, you're doing it for the long run because you're creating a better world. And that I liked about the book. I, I liked about the idea. And guess what? It takes a lot of the stress off because if it doesn't work out this time, you've learned something, move on to the next time. And that, that would be it in a, in a nutshell. That's great, Don. Thank you so much. And thanks. He reads a book. Well, he probably reads 20 books a month, but he reads one on our behalf and writes the article. And, it, you know, it's really a serious contribution that you're making and uh, publishers are starting to get interested in the writing you're doing that's connecting their books to grateful leadership. So that's what I would call a win-win. So thank you for that. The Courage Map publisher wanted to have your article to distribute and, um, you know, say that this this caught public attention in a deep and meaningful way. So. That's that's really excellent. Keep Thank keep you. on doing Thanks, it. Sir. You're doing great. Okay. And then, uh, sorry. What what did you say? No, I just said thanks, Judy. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> you're welcome. I got that. Okay, and then uh, we had an, another wonderful contribution from our own Roxy Nevin, Grateful Parenting. Teaching gratitude before the ABCs. How a gratitude culture is created and influenced in early development. Isn't that great? I mean, everybody thinks ABCs first. Well, Roxy has made a very good case for starting with uh, a, a gratitude practice. Sure. Um, I you know, frequently see posts on the internet that involve a mother saying something that her child said that sounds incredibly intelligent. And I noticed that in the comments, there's always a lot of people who don't seem to believe that a child had said something so insightful. And it reminds me that a lot of people are just blind to the, the real, you know, intelligence of children and how early they are able to uh, comprehend and use logic and reason, and most people think that, you know, kids don't have that ability until they're much older, but I hear some incredible things coming, you know, from children, and 
and they're just a lot more intelligent than what people understand. And I think that when they're very, very small, we can teach them gratitude simply by being grateful for all the little things that they do that we don't, you know, we take for granted. We just, when they take their first steps or when they point at things or bring, you know, little tiny babies and when they babble and things like that, we can take those moments when they're tiny and instill a culture of gratitude in them by being grateful for the fact that they're communicating at all and show them some appreciation for their contribution to the team of the family. And I think that, that it breeds a culture of gratitude when you do this from a young age. And um, I've seen it you know, with my own kids and with my friends' kids. And I, I think that it's really important to remember how much kids can understand long before we believe they can understand it. That's incredible, and uh, your article has caught uh, the attention, by the way, I'll fill you in on it later, by, of somebody who wrote an article on project management and parenting, and uh, she was with the Ritz-Carlton Hotels for many years, and she was very interested in your article. Great, thanks. So, keep up the great work. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I'll connect the two of you. Okay, so uh, your uh, latest reluctant contributor uh, <laughs> is, is your podcast host, which is uh, one Judith W. Umless, uh, who, who stepped in when Jim Trella had um, done, he reached his third full year of podcasting every Monday morning without fail, never missed a single week through deaths and births and celebrations and who knows what else. But uh, Jim, I realize every week <laughs> what goes into creating a podcast. And uh, I, I must uh, once again thank you for three years of just superb work. And all of his episodes are in the archives, and I, I, I know some people who are going back and listening to every single one of them again. Susan Ferente, who couldn't be with us today, so sorry. Um, she um, is a Grateful Leadership Certified Professional Level 1, and uh, she's taken this work out, the, out into the world, and she just is listening to all your podcasts again, and some of my new ones, too. But anyway, I want, to, I want to play a particular segment from the podcast I did uh, a couple of weeks ago after interviewing Shana Serrano. And Shana and I have known each other, as she says, forever. Um, but it, it started about 14 years ago, soon after The Power of Acknowledgement was published. And then she was in the, the uh, Air Force and then uh, the Army. And she's now stationed in Germany. And she has undertaken a major product project. Uh, she's decided to write her uh, Doctor of Business Administration dissertation on grateful leadership, grateful leadership, measuring its value in an evolving, globally connected world. And I had her on as a guest. And in the interview, she said something that really surprised me, and I want to share that with you. And the conclusion, you know, Shana, I'm so delighted that you're here today. You really made me think and gave me the material for this podcast. So I'm going to play a short segment. And um, So why? And we'll this is what she told me in our conversation that. before the actual podcast began. I stayed connected to this work because of the connection I had with you, she said very clearly and simply. I think I was dumbfounded to hear this. I must admit that I thought she was going to describe the power of the work, the difference it makes in the world, and all the great stuff I deeply and passionately believe in. But connecting with me? My ego wasn't quite big enough to hold that one. And then she went on to describe how I'd been there for her during a challenging period in her life. I do remember recommending a book she said made a real difference. 
and I checked in on her every so often. And then she talked about the power of the work too, almost as an afterthought, which I found so interesting. But I kept thinking about this observation and realized that others had said this to me in one form or another too. And I started to get a sense of what she might have been describing. So after much rumination, I came to this conclusion. I think it starts with this. Many, many people respond positively and powerfully and see the true value of grateful leadership and the power of acknowledgement after they read one of the three books or attend a session or take a course on the subject. But then, and here's the key, those who contact me afterward all share a common trait. They want to spread the message. It's as though it's something they've always known, personally practiced, but never had the validation or the courage to share this behavior and set of principles at work in their organizations. Once they come forth and reveal this to me, our fates are truly and positively sealed and in the best way possible. And I have kind of a hard time describing this, but once we personally connect, it's as if we recognize each other from somewhere, from everywhere. As Shana so eloquently put it, personally, I feel like I've always known you. So it's always shocking to see a start date associated with that. I couldn't have said it better. To me, these people who reach out to me because they want to carry the message forward are like bright lights. Anyone who resonates with this work, to me, is special. Is that egotistical of me? No, I really don't think so. It's as if they have special qualities which allow them to see and immediately connect with and believe in the seven principles of acknowledgement and the five C's of grateful leadership as if they've always practiced them, which many of them have. Maybe because they've practiced this on their own, but have not gotten much agreement out there in their workplaces for it, they instantly connect with what I'm teaching and feel like they're gaining the tools and stories and anecdotal evidence to teach others how to practice it. Not everyone does connect with it. I'll be the first to admit this. Those who do are like the pebbles in a pond that cause never-ending ripples. They feel compelled to share the work with others, who then share it with yet others. They become the torchbearers, the people to whom I've turned over the mysteries and enigmas and the surprises of this truly transformational technology. So that sums it up uh, in terms of, it's so interesting because every single person here today in our core audience is one of those people who has gotten the message, received it in a deep way that resonates with everything they believe in, and are now taking yes. it forward. Actually, no, it's more of a so, comment. Jamie, it's a Judy. I remember hearing this on the podcast when you originally put it out there and it resonated. And then you're listening to it again. It was that that made me reach out to you years ago in my acknowledgement when about, you remember my boss that, that, uh, that fired me. I actually acknowledged him for that. And it was that feeling yeah. that, you know what, I've been trying to do this for so long, I've been trying <laughs> to reach out, and that's what drove me to start the Art of Grateful Leadership podcast, to do something. And so, yes, I that resonates with me so much, I couldn't have said it wow. any better. Thank you. Wow. Uh, I feel deeply acknowledged by that, Jim, really, coming from you as the... Uh, ultimate podcast host in my book. And uh, <laughs> so so thank you. And, and again, it's so interesting that every single person here has either taken very definitive steps to um, carry the message forward, you know, through certifications 
or they're thinking about it. And uh, I just wanted to report on Angela Brown. Um, I'm so excited because she, uh, we did our run through for her certification level one. And I, you know, I don't want to prejudice the audience or anything, but, but she is a master, you know, she, she can teach this tomorrow. But we have another part in our certification process, which is to have her present it to a group of people. I reach out first to the uh, people who have stepped forth to be part of the Grateful Leadership Advisory Committee. And there are about a dozen people on that committee. But if you're not on it, if you haven't you know, officially signed up for it, let me know that you want to be on the list of people that will be invited to attend Angela's real first full session. She won't have me interrupting her. I'm just going to be a, you know, um, a, a quiet observer. And everybody else will have a chance to be a participant and ask questions and ask for clarification. So Angela, do you, do you want to say anything about the, you know, how you feel about this? Going forward, I was so so proud of you oh, just, with our run through the other day. Okay. I'm having a little trouble, and I'm wondering if it's my Might my be. Uh, else, headset. Else I don't want to talk to but my go ahead. Right? If, That's if not the point can here. Hear her. <laughs> I can hear you, Angela. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, so now, now you're better. I am now I hear you better. Really excited to finally be walking through the door of this certification process. And I say finally because my journey started at least three years ago. And happenstance has gotten in the way of me officially pursuing this. And yet it is um, something that I've held on to for a long time, much like what we've talked about today and what you heard. You know, I have felt the strong connection to this the first time I saw Judy speak at IPM Day. And um, I have just always continued to go back to it. And so I am so thrilled to now continue to find a way to share this on a bigger scale through my certification process. So really, really excited. Look forward to sharing uh, my approach with each of you or anyone who is available to come and then also trying to um, continue messaging this more formally in my organization where I work and perhaps to, with the customers we serve. And what's so interesting about Angela's organization, CAI, is that it's kind of a, uh, a traveling uh, HR Department for hundreds of companies in the uh, North Carolina We're area. Is that, organization did I say that, that accurately, Angela? Medium-sized businesses in North Carolina, and our primary function is HR services, but we also offer learning services and development services, as well as consulting opportunities for for other small businesses. So, really, it's just a neat opportunity to not only potentially have an impact in my organization in a different way but also have impact potentially to those we serve. So really thrilled about it. Again, this is something I kind of do all the time, every day, and yet I feel as if this certification will provide me even more strength and power behind it with all of your support. How oh, great. And um, Angela was sharing something with me the other day. I think you said you start meetings with what are you grateful for, and uh, Absolutely. it goes into a word cloud uh, document. Yeah. So you, you want to talk about this for a second? It's, uh, it's, it's so adorable. I love the coffee's a little bit bigger. What are you grateful <laughs> for? Coffee, a little bit bigger than family, which means more people. Yeah, and there's some <laughs> funny people. ones on here too, which were I coffee kept in on purpose family. people would ask questions, right? So. This is just a practice where I've started, particularly during the COVID crisis, because we have been supporting, remember, small to medium sized businesses who are heavily impacted by this. Um, and so there's been, a, it's been pretty high stress in my organization to make sure we can help the people that we're here to help. So 
So I started kicking off my meetings with, hey, you know, can you give me one ray of sunshine? What's one thing that you have gratitude about today or excited about that you want to share? And just give me one word. And so I've sort of behind the scenes been collecting this. Um, I have, I think, five or six pages of words. And um, the, the goal here is to continue to collect it until we find ourselves in a position where we can be back in person or even partially in person um, as a workforce and to give this as a giveaway to our staff with either like a paperweight or a handwritten card from our executive leadership or both or something that says along the lines of don't forget when things get tough what we're so grateful for because this is the words of my team uh, or my colleagues my whole organization um, on paper and so every week i sort of regenerate a new one just to see what it looks like um, there was a time when family was much bigger but sunshine, because we've had beautiful weather in North Carolina this spring, um, has been a big one, as well as coffee, um, because I think my hypothesis is this COVID crisis has gone probably longer <laughs> than anyone maybe would have been anticipated when you asked them this question back in February. So anyway, a little bit, a little bit of what CAI um, is feeling through this crisis, and also a little way to lift them up when we all come back together one day, I hope. I love it. I love it. And um, Stephanie, did you have your hand up, Stephanie Hanko? So I know you've been bringing grateful leadership to your organization in a more informal way, which is which is great too. So I just, I just didn't know if um, you know you wanted to say anything. But as I said, that podcast, you know, I was thinking of people like you. You don't have to be certified to carry this message forward, and certification is just a way to make sure you know how to teach other people who may not be as natural about it as you are how to do it. Because anybody can be taught. And I've had some real challenges presented to me. And I can prove that anybody, I mean anybody, can be taught. So um, OK, if, if not, then I want to just give uh, Shana a few minutes to give us a, an update on your dissertation. I think you've been having some wonderful conversations with members. I've been hearing about it from both and um, members of the Center for Grateful Leadership. Hey, Judy, can you hear me? A few words about um, per your Perfect, because I've been having some process. issues hearing people through the, through the podcast um, yeah, or perfect. through the webinar. Um, yeah, I've been having some amazing conversations, and I'm looking forward to yeah. tomorrow's coffee yeah. call with Angela and Roxy, we're gonna just have a conversation and I'm super excited about that. I wanna be, I wanna see Angela do her magic. Um, so definitely count me in for that. Um, um, I've had some other great conversations um, with Jonathan and um, some Good. other people. Um, it's been super helpful for me. I'm at the point now, I'm waiting for my chapter one to get approved. Um, it got kicked back to me last week for, uh, it, it's getting smaller and the, the issues are getting smaller and smaller. So I expect to have my chapter one approved very soon. And while I've been waiting on that, I've been just starting to get into the research and starting to go down the rabbit trails that everybody's been so wonderful at um, providing me, you know, hey, did you look into this and, and checking into that. I kind of have an outline for my chapter two, and now I'm just going through right now and um, digging digging my way through that to see to see what's out there. Um, it's been interesting because I know we had a conversation about how I was talking about how I saw um, grateful leadership as qualitative and not quantitative. But when you get into the research, um, the research on gratitude is the opposite. It's all it's all quantitative based. So it's been kind of interesting to kind of see how that pulls itself together and helps me string together what I'm trying to say. That's fascinating. Yeah, and uh, we've been sorely missing the data, the, the quantitative uh, evidence and proof. I mean, I have thousands of anecdotal stories, evidence that I can share with you. And I have shared them through my books and my uh, trainings. 
but the you know the data that you can bring that any one of us can bring to our leader and say this works this has people be uh, you know this percentage more engaged this uh, retains them you know th this number of years longer and uh, it, it makes the bottom line better you know that those kind of details and, and I you know I don't expect you to do all of that in one thesis but <laughs> whatever you do will be helpful to moving us in that direction um, where we can show the yeah, show show us the evidence well you here it is look at this paper that's been written and uh, it's in all the academic journals now and uh, I appreciate and that a thousand citations article so <laughs> I'm, I'm dreaming big Shane. maybe that yeah yeah so um, you know I'm uh, extremely grateful uh, to you for taking this on, like I said in the podcast and to you personally, it's like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, you're going to spend the next year of your life doing this. And it's amazing that you, um, to me, that you, so I want, or you're doing it and, you know, all the paths that you're going to go down and you're going to have to kind of find a different path to go on. Well, absolutely. I, and I do want to follow up real quickly, um, Roxy, uh, on, her, um, <laughs> so, on the, anyway. the, the children and gratitude. I just was reading before we started the call, I was reading a study about um, teaching children gratitude and that adolescents <laughs> in that, hang on a second. Yeah, my dog is crazy. She sees <laughs> Don't worry, he's welcome too. All right, sorry, I got that under control. She sees another, we have a big window it. and she sees another dog and the world comes to a stop. Um, but anyway, so the study I was, the study I, I was just reading before we, um, before we started this was so appropriate because it was about <laughs> adolescence and the age of like 10 to 14 is when you can start um, cognitively understanding gratitude and its impact on um, in children. And I thought that that was really interesting. Hey, can, we, can you send me the link to that? I'd be interested to read that. That's, uh, that's Absolutely, I was message. going to type. I'll send you the. I'll send you the file. Yeah, I would too. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to see that too, uh, Shana. That'd be great. All right. Well, um, we've come to the official end of the webinar of the June webinar, and. Uh, uh, I'm around if any of you want to stay around and keep chatting.